Hello there and welcome to the second of our Pathology Concepts online e-learning modules. My name is Lucas Brammer. I'm a medical student at the University of Bristol and I'm also uh, involved with the University of Bristol Medical School's Pathology Society. Uh, so in this module I'm going to look at the ways tissues adapt to injury and also look at the way that cells die, so tissue death as well. And first of all, we're going to start by looking at the factors that contribute to injury and death. We're then going to look at how tissues uh, initially adapt to stressors. And we'll both look at that in terms of physiological processes and pathological processes. And then we'll look at some actual adaptive processes that cells are able to perform, like hyperplasia and hypertrophy. We're then going to look at the two forms of cell death necrosis and apoptosis, we'll compare and contrast those and we're going to put in some clinical context as we go through this. So the first point to make is that tissues are pretty well adapted in order to resist uh, injuries that they might come across throughout various different points in the body. And it takes a persistent noxious stimulus in order to cause irreversible damage to the tissue which means that the cells will die. Now that means that in the early stages when the healthy tissue is being exposed to some sort of new stimulus or injurious stimulus, there is a degree of reversibility to some extent, and we do see adaptive processes, so we're going to be looking at those um, first and foremost. But what we also see in the body is that cells will die as part of a normal process, in a, in a process of pre-programmed cell death, and the best example of that is in embryogenesis. And it's things like where you see one form of tissue being replaced by another, um, and you also see places like the interdigital webs in the embryo where cells die by apoptosis in order to uh, destroy those interdigital webs to create the digits. So what sort of factors can actually cause harm to cells? Well, most cells in the body rely on oxygen to perform aerobic metabolism. And this requires oxygen in order to form ATP. So if you deny tissues oxygen, then that's known as hypoxia. And that can cause severe damage because then they switch over to anaerobic processes where they generate uh, lactic acid and then this can cause damage to tissues if that lactic acid eventually builds up. So hypoxia is an important cause of tissue damage. Infection is obviously um, one of the things that can cause major damage to tissues. If an organism um, manages to get inside tissues and cause damage then it triggers off that inflammatory process and equally if it infects many cells then it can obviously um, quite quickly uh, lead to the death of those cells. Chemicals and toxins in the body are really, really important because these can cause tissue damage. Anything that involves a mechanical trauma or force can also cause a damage to a tissue by causing this inflammatory process and directly um, causing a mechanical damage to the cells. We then have things like radiation. So radiation is actually used and manipulated in order to kill rapidly dividing cells in cancer. But it can also, unfortunately, cause damage to the tissue around it because radiation is actually harmful to cells. Now, as good as the immune system is at defending us, there are also times when the immune system goes a little bit haywire and goes out of control in autoimmune disease. And at that point, the processes of the immune system actually become um, destructive. Genetics can also harm cells. If there is a change to a cell's genome through a variety of processes that are actually presented here, such as radiation, for example, then this can cause a disastrous consequences for protein synthesis, and the cell just can't function anymore. So that would ultimately lead to its cell death. And also, if cells can't access the nutrition that they need, if they can't access key elements and electrolytes that they need in order to function, then this is obviously going to impair their function, and eventually they will die. So all of these factors really are broad categories because many things can fit into these different categories. So for instance, in hypoxia, you can also link that to ischemia, and ischemia is a word for a lack of blood supply. So what happens as a result of that, then you don't get oxygen. It becomes ischemic. So how do cells respond to tissue injury then? Well, some sort of stimulus comes along and causes our cell injury, this stimulus for example that we've seen on the previous slide and to some extent this might be reversible so we might have repair processes that can bring the cells back to normal for example but then the tissues will always be begin to adapt at some point and in some cases that might be a positive adaptation whereby it brings the tissue back to its normal functioning state or actually the adaptive processes 
may worsen the situation. And you might end up with a maladaptation that actually produces a suboptimal tissue that makes the tissue vulnerable once again, and that could ultimately lead to the death of cells. So this diagram sort of sums up what, what goes on. You get some form of healthy tissue that has a new stimulus being applied to it that causes injury or causes some form of change in the cell that will trigger tissue adaptation at the same time. And that will either be a positive adaptation and bring the tissue back to normal and reverse the change, or it can be maladaptive and it can actually cause a worsened effect. So I'll give you an example. When you're exercising in the gym, um, you have healthy skeletal muscle tissue and when you actually begin to work the muscle and expose it to mechanical loads then it actually causes some damage to the skeletal muscle cells but what that causes is this process of hypertrophy which is an increase in the cell size and what that means is that the muscle cell sizes actually increase and the myofibrillar content is actually increased so you get more force generation and that actually gives you a healthy tissue as a result of that now this isn't seen in something like the heart for example. You'll get hypertrophy in the heart but that's actually a maladaptive process because in a hollow organ like the heart when you get hypertrophy it actually makes the wall of the heart much thinner. So in patients that have a congestive heart failure for example then one of the compensatory responses that the ventricles do is to hypertrophy and they get bigger. And so what happens as a result of that is the wall actually gets thinner and it actually makes the heart quite vulnerable and it reduces its function. So that would be an example of a maladaptation. Now, it doesn't have to be something that's actually harmful that can cause a tissue to adapt. So, for instance, uh, when women become pregnant, the breast tissue, or the, the glandular content, the endocrine content of the breasts actually increases and you get an increase in the, uh, the number of glands in the breast. And that's an adaptive process to a stimulus, which is a change in the horm hormone um, content. So cells can adapt to a variety of different stimuli. So some examples then of tissue adaptation. I've talked about tissue hyperplasia um, briefly before. And hyperplasia is an increase in cell number. So you see an increase in the size of the tissue. And the reason for that is because the cells have increased in number. Okay, there's an increase in the number of cells being produced. Now, hyperplasia can occur in that physiological situation that I've just talked about, in the breast tissue when a woman becomes pregnant. But hyperplasia can also um, occur in other places and actually eventually become a risk factor for the development of a cancer. So, for instance, in the endometrium, you can get endometrial hyperplasia. And if you get a certain atypical form, so a, a, an odd form of hyperplasia, then what will happen is you predispose um, a, a risk for uh, development into endometrial adenocarcinoma, for example. So hyperplasia is an increase in cell number, and it's a tissue adaptation, and we'll come back to that because it forms the basis of one of the cases that we're going to have a look at. Now hypertrophy is an increase in the tissue size again, but this time it's due to an increase in the volume of the cells. So the cells get bigger, but they don't actually change in number. So you can see here we've had two cells to start with, we've still got two cells, but both are bigger. So hyperplasia and hypertrophy are two terms that can get confused quite easily. But hyperplasia is an increase in cell number, and hypertrophy is an increase in cell size. And that's a really important uh, distinction to make. So another form of tissue adaptation is this thing called metaplasia. And this is important because it falls into a certain clinical uh, condition that is really important to recognize. So <clears throat> this is the reversible change of one mature cell type into another. So it's when one, what we call terminally differentiated cell, a mature cell that's now fully developed, becomes a completely different cell type. And this will be due to changes in the DNA construct, okay? So the best example of this and most important clinical example is in the esophagus. The esophagus normally has an epithelium that's lined by stratified squamous epithelium, these egg-shaped cells all stacked up on top of one another. Now, under the influence of chronic exposure to gastric contents that are coming up from the stomach in things like uh, acid reflux disease, then you actually see those cells transform from stratified squamous cells to columnar cells, and these cells have then got goblet cells in them as well. 
So you see this characteristic change from a stratified squamous epithelium to a columnar epithelium with goblet cells on it. And that condition is known as Barrett's esophagus, and it actually is a risk factor for the development of esophageal cancer. Now, I mentioned that in hyperplasia there was an increase in turnover, and that might predispose uh, a person to developing cancer as well. And these, these two processes are really important, hyperplasia and metaplasia, because in hyperplasia you get an increase in cell turnover, which means that there's an increase in the number of cells, and the faster that cells are dividing, the more chances there is of error in that replicative process. And errors in the replication process could eventually cause a mutation that is malignant or can form a tumour. And in metaplasia, you're actually seeing DNA changes. And again, changes in the DNA that allow cells to escape regulatory um, cell cycle genes are really important because they, again, are the predisposing factors that can lead to development of cancer. So let's have a look at a case to put this all into a context. So in this case, Brian's 65 years old. He's recently had some difficulties in urination. Uh, and when he goes to the toilet, he now struggles to start passing urine. And when he does, he doesn't pass very much at all. And he tells you, when he comes to see you, that it seems to start and stop and it's really weak and it sort of just seems to dribble out. So he's getting quite concerned about this because now he's noticed that he's waking up frequently in the night and he needs to go to the toilet more often. Um, than he ever used to go previously. So this gentleman has now got nocturnal symptoms and he's going to the toilet a lot more often. He's not appearing to pass very much when he does go to the toilet. That's a bit of a worrying sign because this is pointing towards some sort of prostate disease. The prostate um, classically will um, present with these clinical symptoms that we broadly refer to as prostatism. So it's things like difficulties in urination, um, nocturnal symptoms, changes in urinary frequency, and what we call weak stream. So we're seeing that here because when he seems to start, there's not much coming out. And things like dribbling and terminal dribbling are, are signs that there's some sort of obstruction there, and that's caused by the fact that the prostate is changing. He denies any weight loss, tiredness, or loss of appetite. And they are really important points to consider because this could have been a picture of a prostate cancer, for example. So the GP performs a rectal examination and he finds the prostate to be enlarged. Um, he also performs a urine dipstick and he orders some routine blood tests and requests this test called a prostate specific antigen, which I'm not going to go into any detail about, but this is important for the condition that we're looking at here. So he does the urine dipstick and that's completely normal, there's no abnormalities in there, and the prostate specific antigen is raised for a gentleman of his age. So this raised prostate specific antigens prompts the GP to then refer this gentleman on to receive a, a biopsy in order to find out if there is anything sinister going on within the prostate. So the prostate is a gland that sits basically at the bottom of the bladder in men um, and it surrounds the urethra. So this is why when the prostate starts to undergo pathological changes then you might see that reflected in uh, changes in urination because it's actually the urethra runs right the way through the prostate. So this is what a normal prostate gland looks like on histology. These sort of whitish spaces that you can see dotted around are all the um, hollow regions of glands because the um, prostate gland, uh, prostate is a gland. Uh, and it's got glands and then in between it's got this uh, fibrous stroma where there's some smooth muscle cells in there as well because the prostate's role is to secrete seminal fluid into the ure urethra. So that's what a normal prostate gland looks like. And when uh, this gentleman has his biopsy and the pathologist looks down the microscope, they see this picture. Now what you're actually seeing here is an increase in the number of glands there. But also, I don't know if you can see in comparison to the previous image, where it was a lot pinker, you can see a lot more blue dots here. And that is because there's a greater number of cells. There's an increase in cell number. The pathologist looks down the microscope and there's no cancer style changes here, but there's an increase in cell number. So this is a condition called benign prostate hyperplasia or benign prostatic hyperplasia. And this is something that is seen in uh, men. It's unfortunately an inevitable consequence of aging in men. Um, it's very, very common. Um, 
but its symptoms uh, are usually very indicative of what's going on because this tends to occur in the region of the prostate that's directly around the urethra. So when that uh, region becomes uh, hyperplastic and you get an increase in tissue size, then obviously that's then going to compress down the urethra and it makes it very difficult for, for men to be able to go to the toilet. Now, in some cases, that can become quite extreme and it can result in a, in a bladder outflow obstruction and you might present with urinary retention, which is quite, um, quite worrying. So what we're seeing here is an application of that process of hyperplasia. Um, there's an increase in cell number. In benign prostatic hyperplasia, it tends to be in the stromal compartment, so that's in these pink bits that surround the glandular tissue. And what that does is it... Um, inevitably increases the size of the prostate. And the only way that you can actually diagnose benign prostate, prostatic hyperplasia, other than looking down the microscope, is to weigh the prostate. Um, and that will give you a definitive diagnosis. But most men have actually got this um, if they're elderly aged at post-mortem. Um, then a lot of men have got this as an incidental finding. So forms of cell death. We've looked at the ways tissue adapts, we've talked about hyperplasia and hypertrophy, and we've talked about metaplasia. Now we need to look at what happens when cells die. Cells die when some sort of stress or injury uh, stimulus persists, and there's been an irreversible injury to that cell. Now there's two forms of cell death. There's necrosis and apoptosis. Now necrosis is a pathological form of cell death, it's always pathological and it always has negative consequences for uh, the organism or the tissue. It's due to external factors, those things that I talked about, maybe hypoxia, maybe um, uh, radiation, etc. all causing damage, it's due to external noxious stimuli and what we see is a pattern of membrane damage that then leads eventually to the breakdown of the cell and the release of contents that then triggers an inflammatory process. So you see inflammation in the presence of necrosis. In apoptosis, this can be either physiological, as I've mentioned in terms of that embryogenesis example, or it can be pathological. And this is a targeted, pre-programmed form of cell death. It results in damage to the DNA. It directly starts to fragment the DNA. So you see DNA fragmentation in apoptosis. And it's an energy-dependent process, so it needs ATP in order to function. But you won't see an inflammatory process like you do in necrosis. So what actually happens in necrosis? Now, I'm not going to go into this in any great detail. There's lots of complicated words that you can go and read about in pathology textbooks that talk about the different phases of what happens in necrosis. But I'm just going to give a very sort of simplistic version of the way this works. You tend to get swelling up of the cells to begin with, so you'll see this cell swelling. You then begin to see... Um, damage to the membrane and we see this process called blebbing where the membrane actually starts to have these little protrusions coming out of it, sort of cytoplasmic pr protrusions on the plasma membrane and then you start to see the nucleus shrink down, there's condensation of the nuclear material so all the chromosomes and things start to, um, start to condense and then eventually the nucleus shrinks and dissolves into the cytoplasm. And what you then see is rupture of the cell, release of all the horrible contents that are, are stuck inside now, and then that will trigger that inflammatory process because you're getting all these fragments released that the body's not used to seeing and the immune system uh, essentially begins to eat them up. So there are different types of necrosis. Necrosis is death due to these external stimuli factors, and it, it has different appearances depending on different tissues. Now, you might see something called coagulative necrosis, and this is seen in the heart, and it's basically seen where there's what we call ischemia. Now, ischemia leads to an um, infarction of a tissue, and that's essentially a form of necrosis that's due to a lack of blood supply. So ischemia is due to, uh, is, is where there is a lack of uh, blood supply causing a lack of oxygen, causing hypoxia, and that then leads to infarction and coagulative necrosis. So that's seen in myocardial infarction, for example. Now, liquefactive necrosis is seen almost exclusive with the, within the brain. There's a very specific reaction that occurs in the brain and the glia are involved. And essentially, the brain just turns into liquid. And this is seen in this example. It's showing you an MRI scan um, of uh, a person that's been uh, treated for brain metastases. And there's actually a cerebral abscess. And in cerebral abscess formation in the brain, you'll see liquefaction of the tissue as it begins to die. 
Gangrenous necrosis is a particularly nasty form of necrosis that's seen in the skin and superficial tissues and is associated often with um, infection or lack of blood supply. It's not very nice at all and you get wet and dry gangrene. And then caseous necrosis is seen in TB and if you watch the first um, of these modules you'll see that we talked about um, granuloma and in the middle of a granuloma in TB you always get caseous necrosis. Uh, caseous because it's, it uh, reminded the person um, that first discovered this and described this um, of cottage cheese. So it's caseous necrosis and that's an example of caseous necrosis in the pleura of a person that had TB. So there are all the different types of necrosis. Now apoptosis is very different. It's a form of precise uh, targeted programmed cell death and there's two pathways in which apoptosis can occur. And again, I'm not going into any massive detail with these. But the first process involves binding to receptors on the cell. And there are actually um, death receptors on the cell. The example, example that I'm giving here is a uh, fast ligand and the fast receptor on the surface of cells. Fast ligand comes along and bites that receptor. It then triggers a load of intracellular reactions the result in the activation of these really important proteins called executioner caspases. <coughs> if you just remember caspases, that's really, really important because the caspases are essentially the proteins that trigger the, um, the enzymes that will ultimately lead to the death of the cell. And they um, trigger enzymes that, for example, will begin to break down and fragment the DNA. And without the DNA, the cell can't function. So that's sometimes referred to as the external pathway or the extrinsic pathway of apoptosis, when a ligand comes along and it binds to a receptor and triggers intracellular uh, signaling uh, mechanisms sorry, that then lead to the activation of these caspases. Now the caspases can also be activated if there's some sort of damage to the cell. So this includes things like DNA damage, if there's a lack of any growth factors coming towards that cell, um, and if there's some sort of error in protein synthesis, the cell can recognize I'm not doing my job properly and it essentially kills itself. So what happens is that there will be membrane changes, there will be changes to the function of the cell, and that's then picked up by these uh, BCL2 family uh, proteins. And they, there are basically two families in the fact that there's BCL2 sensors and BCL2 effectors. So these proteins that can detect these changes that are happening and then proteins that can actually bring into effect the activation um, of other uh, mechanisms that will then trigger the caspases. And the BCL2 effectors effect effectively act on the uh, mitochondria and the mitochondria will then initiate the activation of the caspases. So once the caspases begin to be activated, we get fragmentation of the DNA, the cell, fun cell function completely, completely breaks down, the cell completely shrinks down, and you get the formation of these little apoptotic bodies where there's fragmentation of the DNA, so you see uh, fragmented nuclei, you see fragmented DNA in there, and you see these little apoptotic body bodies. Um, and you can actually see those down the microscope. So cell death, to put into context, um, this is an incredibly artificial scenario that I'm going to give you now, but um, it, it's given a shot of putting it into some sort of um, process. Now, Barbara is 59 years old and she's got type 2 diabetes. Uh, together with her husband, she owns a farm and she, one day she's working on there and she has a serious incident in which she traps her leg in a piece of farm machinery. She then cuts open, she cuts open her leg um, and so she requires some emergency surgery. Uh, to repair the wound. Now she recovers from that fairly well, she's discharged from the hospital, um, but then weeks later um, she's not really been turning up for checkups to be able to, to check on this wound, she's not been very good at, uh, at looking after it, and she then presents with a raging fever and she's very very unwell. And then the doctor goes to examine her leg and he sees something that looks like this, and I apologise for the gory picture. But the black areas that you're seeing here are places basically where necrosis is taking place. What has happened in this scenario is that this lady has had some sort of traumatic injury to the skin and there are organisms that live on the skin um, and there are organisms that are found probably within the muck of, of, of farm machinery where it will have been exposed to all sorts of weird and wonderful bugs um, and then cuts her leg and then exposes her tissues to these, uh, this plethora of uh, nasty uh, microbes. They've then gotten into the skin
and they'll have sat there. Now she would have had this um, repaired, and this is why it's quite an artificial um, uh, scenario here, but essentially then her wound's not gotten much better and things have managed to get back in. And because she also has type 2 diabetes, um, we'll assume that this is maybe not greatly controlled diabetes and that she's quite immune compromised, so her immune system isn't functioning as well as we'd like it to. And so what can then happen is an infection can get inside and it can cause a particularly nasty infection. So let's look at this a little bit more. The doctors decide to take some blood cultures and what they grow in those blood cultures are our old friends from the first uh, module, the group A streptococci, so streptococcus pyogenes. So what do we need to do? Well, these are the organisms that we've seen under the microscope, again, that string of pearls. This is an infection that's known as necrotizing fasciitis. So there's been an infection and inflammation of the deep fascia. So this is a deep tissue infection. And this has resulted in quite severe necrosis of that tissue. So that's why it's called necrotizing fasciitis. And this is an example where an infection has gotten into there, it's persisted, and it's resulted in actually the, the death of a very large, the necrosis of a very large number of cells. And then the, it, this is spreading very, very rapidly. So what needs to be done? Well, what actually um, is done, sorry, again for the gory picture, is in surgery they will open up um, this and begin to remove all the areas of tissue that are necrotic. Because the problem is that this patient will need some quite um, aggressive antibiotics in order to try and clear this infection. And what they will need to do is try and remove as much of this necrotic tissue as possible because antibiotics can't actually get into um, dead cells, dead tissue, so it effectively walls itself off with all this uh, dead tissue from the antibiotics. So you need to actually perform what's called debridement of the wound, which is where you scrub the wound down, get rid of all the necrotic and horrible tissue, and that will allow you hopefully to be able to give them antibiotics and stop the infection from spreading. Because the great danger here is that this patient um, could end up needing an amputation. So necrotizing fasciitis is a particularly extreme example um, of necrosis. So just to summarize then, cells can adapt in response to stress and adaptation may be physiological or pathological. Hyperplasia is an increase in cell number as a result of increased turnover and hypertrophy is an increase in cell volume. Metaplasia, that process of converting one cell type into another, is another example of cellular adaptation. Any persisting noxious stimulus might result in irreversible damage to the cells and that triggers cell death. And necrosis is a form of cell death that results from um, external influences, external harmful stimuli that initiates an inflammatory response in the cell and has different morphologies depending on the different tissues it's found in. Apoptosis is that pre-programmed form of cell death um, that's not necessarily part of a pathological process, but it can be. So, uh, for instance, it can be um, found in certain cancers, etc. It occurs in two pathways, that ligand binding external pathway or that intrinsic mitochondrial pathway. So that's it for tissue adaptation and cell death. I hope that's been useful to you. Uh, please leave comments and please ask questions uh, in the comments section below this video. Um, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you in the next one.